right. Uh, so the kind of preface of this paper is um, I submitted my PhD thesis on Friday and wrote this in about three hours on Saturday. Uh, so bear with me. But the general point um, that I want to get across with this paper is that there is a lot of baggage within the term frontiers. And it's the sort of thing that when we study a frontier, any frontier, and we decide to use that term, uh, we need to just generally be aware of. Um, so the first thing I'm going to discuss briefly are the, the one we know best, the Roman frontiers. Uh, we'll touch on the Wild West, uh, American frontiers. Uh, we're going to go to Australia and the frontier wars. Alaska, the last frontier. Space, the final frontier. Then we've got the frontiers of the European Union and uh, Antarctica and climate change, which is also known as the last frontier. Uh, so Roman frontiers have been uh, studied and described in this way for a very long time in many different types of uh, publications, be them popular novels um, or uh, sort of the general like nonfiction type books. Uh, we've got Rome kind of being discussed uh, in this way from academics from dating from the early 20th century um, and earlier. We have massive um, kind of generalized publications from con uh, conferences like the Roman Frontier Studies, the Limas Congress, which is run every four years. Um, we've got some very well-known academic books. Uh, this is Whitaker's Seminal Frontiers of the Roman Empire, uh, I think the 2004 um, edition. And, you know, recently we've, we've got uh, papers coming out that are explicitly about why we ought to be studying Roman space, like Roman frontiers as an entity. Um, so within kind of Roman archaeology as a, as a sub-niche, uh, the frontier is uh, something that's got, is like an idea that's got a lot of lasting power and people have been engaging with it and talking about it and um, learning from it for uh, over a century. And some of the popular ideas that have kind of been coming out recently are that the, the, the frontier is not a border, it's not a line, it's a zone, it's a space where people come and engage and create something different. So while um, in the early 20th century in particular, it was thought of as a line between civilization and barbarity, uh, it's grown a lot since then, and it's now really talked about kind of like a, a living landscape. That's good. Um, now I'm gonna say I, I am American, so I learned about all of this in school. And the American frontier is a very romanticized concept. Um, also known as kind of the Wild West, and there are two main ideas behind it. Uh, the first one is the concept of manifest destiny, or that in the, um, I'm sorry, I didn't even think about putting a map of the United States on this presentation, uh, but generally the American West um, was a space that was based, uh, beyond the Appalachian Mountains, beyond the immediate east coast of New England, and as you start moving west across the continent, it, the frontier slowly slowly shifted further and further west uh, throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. The idea of manifest destiny was the idea that the United States or America was um, literally destined to control all of this territory, to expand from ocean to ocean. Um, and it was the, you know, the white man's duty to do this, to spread the civilization. So it was very much a, a neoclassical uh, concept. Um, then we've got uh, Jackson Turner's frontier thesis from 1893. And he articulated the frontier as something which is essential to American democracy. He said that American democracy is formed by the frontier, by the process of the moving frontier line, and the experience of the pioneer as the actor who did that. Um, now the problem is that eventually you, you run out of frontier, right? <laughs> you can only get so far uh, to the West Coast. And then what, then what happens to the American? Like, how, how, does this, how does this white man like understand himself and his role in his country if he if you can't spread a civilization in this way. Um, well, there are a couple of solutions to this problem. And it was literally thought of within the government, um, some politicians in the early to mid 20th century that America was a nation who needed a frontier. This was one of the reasons why it was struggling so much um, during the 30s, was that there was nowhere to put kind of the great energy of the American state. Uh, and in Franklin Delano Roosevelt said in 1938, um, and just for some context, FDR is the president who, after the, he came into office immediately at the end of the Great Depression, brought his New Deal, 
kind of got everybody working together again and focusing positively on the future. And sort of the language he used was that there is still today a frontier that remains unconquered, an American unreclaimed. This is the great, the nationwide frontier of insecurity, of human want and fear. This is the frontier, the America, that we have set ourselves to reclaim. Um, so this was just generally kind of trying to get people to refocus their energy and do lots of, um, you know, they planted trees everywhere, they worked to various like public works projects. It was a, um, it fed straight into the, the Second World War and kind of the great re-energizing of America. Um, then we've got JFK in 1960. Um, who actually, I didn't know this, but when I was researching this paper, I um, learned that while he's quite seen now, and he's taught now as kind of the president who really launched the exploration space, uh, before he became the Democratic nominee, he wasn't actually that interested in um, any of it. He didn't think it was that important, but clearly something happened, something shifted, and now he's kind of the, the figurehead of the um, space race. So he said in 1960, I'm asking each of you to be new pioneers on that new frontier. My call is to the young in heart, regardless of age, to the stout in spirit, regardless of party. So again, this is something we can all come together and participate in. And I'll get back to JFK um, in a bit. Uh, so I came across this in The Guardian uh, when it was published, and um, I thought it was really interesting because not only is this some, you know, quite, uh, quite, in a sense challenging archaeological work. Um, it's also just the headline itself. It's tapping immediately into. If you ever see, if you see archaeology and frontier in the same headline, you, at least I expect it to be about the Roman frontier. I had no idea when I saw this that this was going to actually be about Australia. Um, so the frontier wars were a series of conflicts fought between the um, uh, the the police force and the. Um, Aboriginals uh, from the late 18th, mostly during the 19th century, but there were a few in sporadic incidents um, in the early 20th century. And what they're discovering now is that these are called the frontier wars. And it was not so much of like a line kind of being spread, it, they were regional and kind of, um, I don't know, bubbled outward in various places at various times. Um, and what the archaeologists have been discovering now uh, through some statistical analysis is that actually, I believe over 20,000 originals were killed, which is a lot more than they ever expected. Um, and the need to kind of understand what had happened has been leading to some um, innovative archaeological work, which has been uh, pretty well published within the popular media. <laughs> so. Uh, this is, this is my, my favorite frontier, because uh, uh, I'm from Alaska. That was me. <laughs> Definitely not how I got to school. So Alaska, when you, when you grow up there, you've kind of got this sense that, you know, you live somewhere different, somewhere special, and that's definitely something that gets kind of beaten into you whenever you leave Alaska, and people are like, oh my god, do you live in an igloo? I'm like, no. No, I don't. Um, as a territory, as a region, Alaska is massive. Um, it was bought in the U.S. Uh, in 1867, right around the same time when they were running out of frontier uh, from Russia for two cents an acre. Um, it's also known as the Secretary of State. It's called William Seward. And it's known as Seward's Icebox or Seward's Folly because, like, what an idiot. Why would he ever do this? Um, but this is about when Alaska got the official nickname. It is official, I checked, of the last frontier. I mean, this is as far as the U.S. is ever going to get. This is the wildest, the most unclaimed land, and it's still very much seen as this. Never mind that we've got almost uh, over 100,000 Native Alaskans, 50% uh, of the population of the state. So yeah, not that many people live in Alaska. Um, we've been living in this region for since the earliest days of prehistory. Um, I was, uh, I was looking, and there's a, there's a couple of very interesting papers that have been written about Alaska, but whenever you start trying to look up Alaska, the last frontier, you get stuck um, in the, the, the deep, dark hole of TV shows about Alaska, which is about anything any, anyone ever wants to talk to me about in the UK. Is have I seen um, whatever is the most recent one? And I'm like, no, no, generally I haven't. Um, 
So while Alaska on the one hand is this state of nature, it also serves America's cultural needs to have a frontier. Apparently this is something we desperately need in order to feel American. Um, it's something wild, remote, foreign. I've had people ask me if, Americans ask me if they need their passport to travel to Alaska. No. Nope. Uh, can you use dollars? Yes, you can. People speak English? Yeah, mostly. Um, I mean, a, a version of English. Um, so it's heavily romanticized, even by Americans, especially by Americans. And um, I created a phrase. It's also heavily TV series sized Uh, yeah, I just wanted to emphasize that, yeah, there's a, a lot of different, uh, they kind of lump together as the Alaska natives, and there's a lot of different ones, and they're all over the state, and they've got a fascinating history. This is a map showing the many different um, regions of different ling uh, linguistic dialects, and uh, there's something that you've, you've not looked into, kind of the archaeology and the history, both of the work into the native Alaskans and to kind of on the edge of climate change, there's a lot of really interesting stuff going. So have a look at that if you've uh, got some spare time. Let's see, I'll start heavier. Oh, and just to emphasize how much it's identified as the frontier, can you see uh, the mail stamp? They literally stamp mail from Alaska as from the Alaskan frontier. I didn't know that until I looked at my post. All right, so now we're gonna get to the, uh, the final frontier. And we're gonna go back to JFK who Again in 1960, I think in the same speech. Uh, we stand today on the edge of a new frontier. See, Alaska. I'm not sure how Alaska, the last frontier, and the final and the new frontier kind of relate, or the final frontier. It's, I think it's a very convoluted relationship. Um, but we stand today on the edge of a new frontier, the frontier of the 1960s, the frontier of unknown opportunities and perils, the frontier of unfulfilled, unfulfilled hopes and unfulfilled threats. Beyond that frontier are uncharted areas of science and space, Unresolved problems of peace and war, unconquered problems of ignorance and prejudice, unanswered questions of poverty and surplus. So to me, this brings in mind kind of the way that the Roman frontier is talked about in that there's this giant space beyond, maybe not space for science, but space for unanswered problems, unconquered problems, uh, unanswered questions, you know, something new. And that kind of begs the question is, you know, well, what if there is somebody out there? Then <laughs> are we just going to replicate the whole... Uh, relationship of people living like on one side of the frontier and the other by doing it with Earth and outer space. I don't know. Um, so the penultimate one, I've got the uh, VU frontiers. And generally, um, although the term frontier is used frequently, it's generally mean to indicate border. And um, but it's still a loaded word. And it's complicated because the borders of the EU are constant, or have expanded. You can see from this map, um, we've got member states who are admitted in uh, 2004 in Eastern Europe. We've got candidates beyond that in Turkey. Um, but we also have the potential for a retraction if Brexit happens. And that doesn't really fit with frontier imagery as linked to civilization and progress because you can't, well, maybe you can, uncivilize a region. Um, so, so that'll be interesting to see kind of what happens with the terminology should this, should Brexit go through. Uh, so the last one, and I'll admit this is the one that I think the frontier imagery is the most um, evocative for, is the Antarctica and climate change. And is, this term is frequently used uh, by scientists in particular. There is a group called the Frontier Scientists who are interested and climate change in the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, you know, it's like he, he, they say here, like for us, this part of East Antarctica is one of the last frontiers, and that is very exciting for science. Uh, when we explore at the very edge of our knowledge, it can lead to huge, ship sh huge shifts in our understanding. This is the British Antarctic Survey. Um, so again, they're at the edge, they're looking beyond, uh, they want to learn something new. And I think that in this case, uh, climate change is definitely the real last frontier because it's something that if we don't solve, if we don't get beyond, <laughs> then we're all in a whole lot of trouble. So in this sense, I think it's, it's a good thing that they're using such a loaded word to kind of indicate the gravity of the situation. And make, again, but making it seem as something that the, you know, the entire world needs to tap into because uh, in a sense, the concepts like the Roman frontier and the American frontier, they're all... Um, you know, very evocative because they evoke, you know, classical imagery, 
But here we've got a frontier that is, you know, a very much of global importance. So somehow we have to kind of divorce this concept from these very specific historical uses. Um, so some brief conclusions. Generally, uh, frontiers, just the use of that term, meaning uh, space or border or region or concept, it evokes ideas about civilization and progress, imperialism, the West, violence, wilderness, nature, the innate need of humankind to explore, and in particular Americans, uh, barbarians, borders, the East, expansion, manifest destiny, space, cowboys, romanticism, something to conquer, uh, discovery. There's probably loads more that I couldn't fit on the slide. Um, and my only real point um, just before all these talks is that I think it's important that when we use it and we talk about frontier theory or just frontiers in general to be aware of all of this baggage and these many different uses. So, thank you. Thank you.